democracy is not a spectator sport. It's all about all of us getting involved. Everybody needs to get active and tag your it. Welcome to What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute. We interview cultural scouts to help us see more clearly so we can act more courageously in turbulent times. I'm Vicki Robin, your host. Today's treat is a conversation with Tom Hartman, host of the nation's number one progressive talk show for over a decade. His tagline is, democracy begins with you. Get out there, get active, tag, you're it. We spoke two days after the election. A little backstory. I met Tom 20 years ago on a bus, on a bumpy road, up to Dharamsala, India, uh, where 40 thought leaders and their partners met with His Holiness the Dalai Lama for four days through a project called the Synthesis Dialogues. Of course, when you have 40 thought leaders all eager to tell His Holiness their truths, you sort of lose the synthesis and you lose the dialogue. And the, pro the project like broke down and the facilitators finally cried uncle and asked for members of the group to see if, to work with them to facilitate the group. And Tom and I raised our hands and thus began years of mutual respect. Talker Magazine ranks Tom as the number one progressive talk show host in America with a cumulative audience of 7 million, excluding the TV audience. For nine years, he also hosted an evening TV program that was first carried by Free Speech TV and later picked up by RTV out of Washington, DC, and he separated from RT in 2017. He's also a four-time Project Censored Award winner, a New York Times bestselling author of 24 books in print. He invented the Hunters in a Farmer's World reframe for ADHD and wrote five books on the subject. So here's Tom. Well, welcome, Tom, to What Could Possibly Go Right, uh, where we ask cultural scouts to put on their headlamps and shine a light on the, the mucky, messy <laughs> near future so that people of goodwill can, can see more clearly and have more courage to act. And um, you have brilliantly unpacked the historical legacies we struggle with today politically how we got here and what remedies we can apply to liberate us from the strangleholds on democracy. And we're passing through what seems to me to be a stress test on American democracy. And as of this moment, the jury is out um, on the results of the election. We're talking on Friday, November 6th. Um, and just whatever, whatever kind of mess we're gonna go through in the next uh, 70 days or so. Uh, the, so the question we pose to every guest is what could possibly go right? And by this, I'm asking you to look out over this vast battlefield of the election and show us the lay of the land. What opportunities for a more perfect union, a sane, healthy, wise union have arisen? What are you paying attention to? What surprises have come? Where did the good people who listen to you and who listen to me step next in the battlefield? According to Tom, what could possibly go right? Well, I think that we could, uh, probably the biggest thing that could go right out of this election is a, an, a widespread understanding among the American electorate and a repudiation of the uh, electoral strategies the Republican Party has been pursuing since the Reagan revolution. Um, back in 1976 and 1978, there were a pair of Supreme Court decisions, Buckley versus Vallejo and First National Bank versus Bilotti. The first said for the first time in the history of the United States that if a wealthy person wants to own a politician to the point that they are literally the only patron of that politician, they give them money, they give them you know, free trips, they do whatever they want, and that politician in turn does nothing but pass legislation of interest to that patron. That used to be called bribery or corruption. The Supreme Court in 1976 said, no, that's called free speech. That rich person's money is actually a form of speech and by buying a politician or even multiple politicians, that's simply the exercise of free speech and the government cannot infringe on that. And in doing so in 76, they struck down dozens of laws that have been passed in 74, 75 and early 76, um, the good government laws that followed the, the Nixon bribery scandals and all the problems with Nixon. So 
Um, and then in 78, two years later, they extended that same logic to corporations in First National Bank versus Bilotti and said corporations are persons. And so they have First Amendment rights too, uh, to buy politicians. The result of that was an absolute flood of unregulated money that poured into the, into the Republican Party and got Ronald Reagan elected in 1980. The Democratic Party at that point in time didn't pursue this because they were the party of the labor unions and the labor unions were basically um, not, uh, not affected, frankly, by the Buck Buckley or Bilotti decisions. But once Reagan came into office, he so effectively gutted the country of labor unions that we went from being one third of workers in America, roughly unionized in 1980, to you know, about 12% by, by the end of the Reagan-Bush era, 12 years later, and it's 6% right now in the private sector. So uh, as a result of that in 92, Bill Clinton wanted to run for president and it was like, where are we gonna get our money from? You know, the labor unions are gutted. We, you know, they can no longer pay us. And so him and Al Fromm put this thing together, the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council, and uh, specifically to raise money for Democrats from big corporations. And their, their idea was, we'll just leave the dirty corporations to the Republicans. We'll let them deal with the chemical companies and the weapons of, you know, manufacturers and things like that. We'll be with the banks and the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies because they're so nice, right? And, uh, you know, what it did was it, it destroyed the Democratic Party. It, 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 it lost its, the party lost its credibility. Um, and it's led to, you know, 40 years of dysfunction or 30 years of dysfunction ever since then on the Democratic Party side. And what the Republican Party did was, you know, they sold their soul in that election of 1980 to the big corporations and the billionaires and have continued to ever since. But saying, hey, we're a party that's completely beholden to big billionaires and big, you know, big uh, corporations doesn't get you votes. And so they had to bring in a few other constituencies. So it was the, the, the white uh, grievance uh, racist vote. It was the gun owner uh, freak out vote. It was the religious nut vote. Um, it was the misogynist vote. Um, so they, they, they brought together this um, bizarre little coalition of uh, special interest groups, basically, in the anti-abortion groups. Uh, and that's been, but, but, you know, they're basically running a con on all these groups because they're just a front, you know, for the, for the billionaires and the, and the big corporations. When, when uh, Trump said that, you know, their mission was to cut taxes and deregulate industry, that really is all that there is to it. But they've been lying to people, all, you know, for 40 years. And now I think, and, and, and the principal way that they've been able to hold power has been through the suppression of the vote, through preventing people from voting, preventing people from registering to vote. And the Democrats have been unwilling to even discuss that up until this election. The fact that this is the Republicans basically one trick pony is suppressing the vote. And uh, you know the main way that they've been suppressing the vote since the 2000 election is by throwing people off the voting rolls so that when they show up to vote, they can't vote. Or if they do vote, they're given a provisional ballot, which in many cases is never counted. So, you know, the upshot of all this is that now uh, in the Trump administration, they've just been right up front about it. We're going to prevent as many people from voting as possible. And if they do get through and vote, we're going to try and not have their vote counted. That's what we're all about. And I think that's a, 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 a hopefully a stunning realization that will sink in across the American landscape. And uh, number one, the Democrats will get their messaging act together and start talking about what they're actually in favor of. And, you know, and, uh, and hopefully uh, they're in favor of a return to the great society of Lyndon Johnson and the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt. You know, the, the things that they historically have been all about, protecting the environment, protecting workers, protecting families, things like that. Um, and taxing giant corporations and billionaires in order to provide those protections. And if that happens, then I think that there's a real, I mean, that's, that's like the best thing that could happen. Um, whether that's going to happen or not, you know, it's going to depend on some competent leadership in the Democratic Party, and it's going to re and it's going to depend on some of the uh, corporate Democrats, the Bill Clinton class of Democrats, which is a little over half the party right now, um, to be willing to tolerate the progressives. We had this uh, bizarre and un uh, unnerving uh, situation a few days ago where uh, one of the one of the uh, members of the We Take Money from Corporations caucus within the Democratic Party, uh, Ms. Spanberger, 
um, on a conference call just said, you know, we lost this election because of the word socialism, which is complete nonsense. Uh, it was actually every single Democrat who lost a seat in this election was one of these corporate Democrats. You know, none of the progressives lost, to the best of my knowledge. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is a wake up moment, not just for the country, but for the Democratic Party as well. Yeah, so where do you see, like, where do you look for the possibility that this is gonna happen? Because, I mean, we're all sort of like, we're trying to come off the bleachers in this election, in, in this democracy, we're trying to come off the bleachers and onto the field. People have been doing that. They've been joining teams and sub teams and being mascots. I mean, we're just trying to find a place on the field to, to tip the game. Um, so where do you see, where do you see like moves happening right now that could actually tip the balance? You know, I think, I think it's the, not like just the hope what we hope for or what we wish for, or, but where is the power moving? Where is a, the power moving? Right. Much, much like in the Republican Party, you know, where you've got the anti-abortion group and then you've got the, anti, you know, the pro-gun group and they kind of tolerate each other, even though, how can you say a pro-gun group is pro-life? I, you know, <laughs> or whatever, you know, they get along. Uh, on the Democratic side, there are a bunch of coalitions, although the Democrats are actually committed to, you know, the, uh, to these coalitions agendas because they're things that will work to the advantage of people, to the, you know, in your, in your uh, benefit to people. Um, we've got a substantial uh, movement to stop global, global warming, uh, to, to deal with climate change, to try to put our, our planet back together. Uh, we've got a substantial movement to try to equalize uh, socially and economically the power imbalance between white people and minorities in the United States and between men and women in the United States. Uh, you've got a substantial uh, uh, coalition that are committed to uh, basic economic reform, uh, particularly with regard to labor and the re-empowerment of labor unions. You've got a substantial coalition who are committed to, to uh, uh, public forms, things like public banking, public utilities. In other words, strengthening the, 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 those parts of the commons that are the, the so-called natural monopolies, you know, power, water, sewage, uh, fire, police. I mean, the things that government really should be doing. And with regard to power and water, and, and now I'd say actually uh, internet as well, that these are things that should be considered the commons and should be run by government for the benefit of people. And, you know, I don't want the government making my blue jeans, but I'm very upset about the fact that there's only one internet service provider that I can buy from and I have to go with whatever price they say and they're not operating in my best interest and they're spying on everything I do and selling that information. So, uh, you know, I can get my internet from the government like the city of Chattanooga did and it's better, it's cheaper, it's faster, it's more reliable and your privacy is ensured. So, you know, those, those coalitions all exist within the Democratic Party and each one of them is complementary to the others because there's a common idea among them all, which is the general welfare of the people of the United States, the common good. And uh, so I, I, I'm, what I'm seeing is that in each one of those tranches, each one of those slices of the electorate, those movements are getting stronger and more active and more empowered and and you know the women's rights movement and the and uh, as well and and uh, the black lives matter movement and uh you know uh, there's a hispanic movement that's that's growing within the democratic party etc that all of these things need to be happening at the same time and the democratic party should be more acting like the conductor of the orchestra rather than the uh, the leader of the parade as it were yeah, exactly. And, you know, we're teetering, we're at the moment when, when it's probably soon will be president elect Biden. And a lot of people have, um, I know this is very political, but a lot of people have held their noses to sort of get Biden all, over the finish line so that we have somebody we can work with to enact the common good agenda, if you will, that and all these, all these tranches represent. Um, and yet, as you said, with that call, you know, on the left, 
very often they say there's not message discipline, there's not discipline. You know, this like becomes the circular firing squad when we get upset <laughs> yeah. for some reason. And, and so where do you see some opportunities for, for transcending that? Is, it, is the opportunity going to come because, because Biden picks the right cabinet or, you know, is it going to come because the, the standard bearer actually forms the proper conversation? Is it going to come because these movements realize we can't depend on anybody to, to make, do it for us? We're going to have to, where, where is that breakthrough at this like potent moment when we haven't, cir we haven't circled up to fire it's, each other? It's happening in two areas. One is the the social area, society at large, that's, you know, all of these movements have emerged largely out of that, um, as opposed to some of the, well, I, I, we don't even need to compare it to Republicans uh, and, and the movement. Um, but the second is the political dimension of it. Um, I, I, I think there's a general misapprehension of, of the role of a politician. Um, even among some politicians, uh, basically what a good politician does is uh, they, more often than not, is they're surveying that social landscape and saying, where's there a parade? And when right. a parade gets large enough and big enough and has enough momentum, then they go down and jump in front of it and hoist the flag and say, this is my parade. Um, and uh, these parades, these, these tranches, these factions within the Democratic Party that I mentioned, are as they get stronger and larger and louder and, and more effective, uh, are drawing more and more political support. And uh, that's just kind of a, uh, you know, an iron law of politics that where the people go, the politicians will follow. And uh, I'm, you know, I, I recognize the importance and the value of political talent. Um, there are some people who are, you know, Barack Obama, for example, is a brilliant politician. Uh, a brilliant orator, a, a, brilli a brilliant articulate spokesperson for all the issues that we deal with. Joe Biden is much less articulate, you know, and I guess, you know, not, not just because of his stuttering, but, you know, uh, more generally, uh, he's not that brilliant a politician. But, but I, you know, at the same time that I recognize the importance of that skill set, I'm also not that big a fan of the great man history or great man theory of history that you know, history happens when extraordinary people step to the fore. Uh, I, I think more often than not, it's not so much an extraordinary person stood up and brought everybody along with them, but that the movement reached the, a point, a threshold point where it drew people who are want to want to be leaders and those with the leadership skills emerged as the winners in the competition for who gets to be the politician at the very front of the parade with the flag. And so, you know, which brings us back once again to, you know, democracy is not a spectator sport. It's all about, um, you know, all of us getting involved, you know, that, that, that everybody needs to get active and tag your it, you know. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, that's, that's where I think, uh, you know, that's where I hope it goes. That's how, if everything really went right, uh, yeah, obviously it's not going to happen quickly, fast, or easily, but I, I, we're at a crisis moment. And, uh, you know, Rahm Emanuel is credited with, you know, saying never let a good crisis go to waste, but that uh, mentality goes back to, uh, to, to uh, Milton Friedman, Ali, you know, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. And, and so we've got a great crisis here. Let's not let it go to waste. Right. I think in the movements, this, it, this awkward word of intersectionality actually is sort of a signifier of something that people are realizing is that your issue is my issue. We're, we're up against something that's larger than all of us that isn't actually embodied in Donald Trump. It's embodied in something else and we can feel it. And if we, if we lose solidarity, we lose. But if we, if we hang together with, with a sort of a shared analysis of, of there's something rotten up there, you know, in the power chain, that feels hopeful to me. Yeah, and that's very different from Clinton's idea of triangulation. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's a sort of a collaborative map. It's sort of we're on belay. In a way, we're on belay. And we understand that it's a risky, this is the risky last part of the summiting, yeah. um, getting out of this. I just have, I just have one other thing. There's two words that have, um, that keep coming to me as sort of 
deeper signifiers. And one is morality and another one is healing. Um, that I feel, to me, I feel like we're in an amoral, we've, we've stumbled into an amoral, you know, slew, <laughs> S-L-O-U-G-H. And, and people are behaving badly and know they are. You know, there's this feeling that there's something contradictory to, to our humanity that's, that we're, we seem to be embedded in. Um, and um, the other one is healing that, you know, it, whatever goes, whatever things happen in the future, in the near future, it's, we have to heal the divides or we can't do it. So I just would like, you know, do either of those words resonate with you for any reason? Sure. We are uh, 4% of the world's population, 1 20th of the world's population, but we produce one quarter of the world's pollution. We have one fifth of the world's COVID and COVID deaths. Um, we, uh, we are hoarding wealth at levels un that are unbelievable. We have the majority of the world's billionaires. Um, we are desperately in need of healing, and yet we're the only developed country among the 34 OECD countries, the wealthiest countries in the world. We're the only one that does not define healthcare as a right rather than a privilege. We're the only one without a national healthcare system. Um, you look at Taiwan, you know, they got their first case of COVID the day after we got ours back in January, January 20th, January 21. Their last death was April 12th. They have, they've had in the entire country during this entire period of time, fewer than 400 cases. They acted. Um, we didn't. And the largest part of how and why they acted was they've got what I believe is the world's best single payer healthcare system. Everybody in the country has a little card that kind of looks like a driver's license with a chip in it that is their healthcare card. And they can literally walk up to any computer terminal in the country and plug it in or plug in their code number, their PIN number, and have instant access to all of their medical records. Any physician anywhere can have access to that within the limits of privacy, uh, you know, any authorized physician. And as a result of this, the country was able to do testing and contact tracing so easily and so instantly and so effortlessly that, you know, like I said, the last time somebody died of COVID in Taiwan was in April and, and here it is, we're in November. So, you know, we have not, uh, gone down that road of saying that healing, physical healing, um, or for that matter, even psychological healing, we, we consider, you know, the brain is like a separate thing from the body, you know, to our, even our health insurance, in many cases doesn't pay for mental health services. So, you know, we have not put that front and front and center. And, and the, the result is that we have, you know, in the developed world, the highest level of infant mortality, the highest level of childhood poverty, the highest level of childhood hunger, the high, highest in the developed world, the highest level of rickets. I mean, you know, it's just nuts uh, what we have, you know, how bad things are in the United States as a result of this cabal, basically, of right wing billionaires who have been controlling our political system since the 1980s, you know, who came along with the Reagan revolution. And, uh, you know, from the Koch brothers to the Adelsons to the, I mean, you know, we're starting to learn their names, you know, the Mercers and whatnot. And, and uh, you know, they're all uh, subscribing to this libertarian Ayn Rand ideology. You know, Ayn Rand famously said that, that you know, subscribing to Jesus's teachings is, is evil. Um, you know, it's just, it's like, this is where these people are at. And, they, and you know, our, our Supreme Court gave them the power back in the 70s. And until we figure out a way to take that power away from them, we're going to have a, an ongoing struggle in this country. Yeah. I do think that naming it as evil, actually, without antipathy toward the individuals, but naming it as an evil that is, has, has its, us in its grip, maybe is part of like what's going to muster the moral force that we need. I'm hopeful. Yeah, I'm hopeful too, actually, Tom. So thank you so, so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure, Vicki. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review, which will help this hopeful message get out to more people. And check out the Post Carbon Institute website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks to all our donors for their support. Thanks also to Cher Miller, Amy Boringrud, and Clara Winter at Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.